Okay. Okay. I'm there. Okay. Good. And we'll see the broadcast. Okay. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome. This is Jim Torrance of the National Network of Sector Partners. I'm going to be your moderator for today's webinar, and I'd uh, like to get started. Our subject today is a growing green economy, opportunities of tomorrow, and we have uh, a, a great guest and presenter, Juliet Scarpa who's the Senior uh, Policy Analyst at Seattle Jobs Initiative and is the author of a report by the same title on the growing green economy and its impact on jobs and career pathways. Because we have a lot of people on the line and to minimize our background noise, we um, have muted all the phone lines. But if you have questions, um, or as we call on you, we will unmute you. And also, if you haven't logged in yet with your audio PIN, we're going to send you reminders. They'll pop up. Uh, without it, we won't be able to unmute you at all. So if you, if you have an interest in speaking, please do uh, enter that audio PIN when you receive it. This webinar is also being recorded, and we will send you a link the recording after the webinar and post that recording on our website. If you would like to ask a question, uh, there's a button you can use to get our attention. It is the raise hand button and it's uh, on the control panel. And if you click on that, we'll call you at the first opportunity. There's also a way to submit questions using the questions pane, which is uh, part of the control panel too. And we will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to your questions before we run out of time, uh, we'll email you an answer afterwards. Last, you may want to minimize your control panel so that you have uh, a full screen to look at instead of a partial screen. There's a button on the left of the control panel that lets you do that. So moving on to uh, more substantive matters, um, we had a great response to our uh, invitation to this webinar. Um, and I know that as a, part a participant in webinars, I always want to know, I'm always curious about who else is participating. Um, if we were all in the same room together, it would be obvious. We'd be able to see each other. But since we can't, uh, here's a moment where you can satisfy your curiosity. Um, this is the first page out of two pages, actually. Uh, you may see some names you recognize and uh, might want to follow up with later. Um, and uh, there may be people on this list whom you would like to ask questions of uh, during the webinar. So feel free to send me questions uh, for any of your colleagues as well as questions for our presenters. Uh, this is the second page. We had over 80 at, uh, registrants for the webinar. And if you registered by 10 p.m. last night, your name should be on one of these lists. I should say that I, I, I noticed in scanning the list a great deal of interest from state agencies on today's call. And states will have great influence in how uh, particularly Recovery Act funding is going to support green jobs initiatives. Uh, states are also uh, positioned to play a role in preparing uh, regional initiatives for discretionary funding that's going to come down to, and uh, of course implementing state policies. Um, there's also, you may notice from the list, uh, clearly strong interest from local workforce areas, and uh, of course from community organizations and advocacy and policy groups too. Um, and I believe there were some industry representatives too. Uh, we're always grateful to have your participation. So just a little introduction about uh, the Insight Center, our organization. Um, the National Network of Sector Partners, or NNSP, is an initiative of the Insight Center. And we were formerly known as the National Economic Development Law Center, if you uh, know us under a different name. This is our mission. Uh, we work in a variety of areas uh, in addition to sector-driven workforce development. And some of our in other initiatives include 
uh, Californians for Economic Security, Closing the Racial Wealth Gap, Inclusive Business Initiative, or INVIS, and the Economic Power of Early Care and Education. Our organization is 40 years old this year, and we're going to celebrate our anniversary as a special part of the NNSP National Conference this November. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And here's our website where you can get more information about who we are. I was pleased also to see on the list many NNSP members. We are a membership organization. Uh, as well as to see some people who may be learning about NNSP for the first time. Um, we have over 350 members who receive services like this webinar. Uh, we also provide email updates, a website, uh, industry-specific communities of practice, research, training, and consulting services, and a national conference. This is our mission, and uh, for those of you who are new to the sector field, uh, sector initiatives are regional, industry-specific uh, uh, workforce partnerships that are structured to benefit both workers and industries. NNSP was one of the first organizations to develop and promote this concept. Every other year, NNSP puts on a national conference, and our last conference in 2007 brought together almost 300 leaders in the field um, and uh, it was a great success, at least according to what, what they told us. We expect this year's conference to be especially noteworthy, um, in part because sector initiatives are emerging in federal and state policy unlike they ever have. Um, there was specific mention of sector uh, strategies in the Recovery Act, for example. Um, and green jobs, of course, are also at the forefront. So with all that relevant policy activity, it should be an exciting time to be in Washington. Uh, it's also a significant year for NNSP because it's our 10th anniversary. So we look forward to celebrating with as many of you uh, as can join us. And here's where you can learn about all things related to NNSP. Now, we're very interested in the topic of green jobs. And uh, one of the ways that we've expressed that interest is through uh, the Strategic Venture Fund, which provides for many grants to uh, advance the knowledge of the field. And the work that uh, Juliet is going to describe uh, received some support from one of those grants because it's in a priority area for us. Um, other priority areas included meeting the needs of communities of color and improving job quality or efforts to improve job quality. And we're going to share uh, results from those. There were eight funded projects through webinars and papers just like this one. So please uh, stay tuned if you're interested. It's going to be a major theme at our uh, upcoming conference. And we are looking for speakers and presenters. So if you have suggestions for people that you'd really like to speak about uh, the green economy, please do feel free to send your suggestions. And. Um, we have, uh, we, we have under construction, I had hoped to have ready for this uh, session, but have not, uh, a resource page um, with uh, lists of publications and other resources of use to uh, practitioners in the field. Um, that will come soon. If there are questions that uh, require, that go beyond the breadth of our knowledge today, or the depth of our knowledge today, we will try to identify and post a resource shortly uh, on that page, as well as sending it directly to whoever asks. So uh, please do suggest resources that you're aware of to contribute to that uh, gathering of information. And we will host another webinar in what is becoming a series on the green economy. Uh, John Carice, who directs the San Francisco Bay Region Center of Excellence at City College of San Francisco, will be sharing his findings of a study of eight energy, uh, energy efficiency occupations. Uh, because you registered for this webinar, we'll be sure to send you an invitation to that webinar, too. So before we go on to Juliet's presentation, I'd like to take a quick poll of where you are developing your green economy sector initiatives. So you take a moment and just uh, tell us where you fit on, on this uh, scale.
So we'll give you just a few more seconds. Okay, it seems like most of you have voted. Here are the results. And uh, what you may see is that there's both a wide range of uh, experience on this call and that uh, many of you are in active planning, which is, which is great. Uh, I think that Juliet's overview and conceptual framework are going to be particularly useful to those of you in the planning stages. So without further ado, I'm going to hand this over uh, to Juliet. And um, Juliet, why don't you take it away? Excellent. Thank you, Jim. And I'd like to start off by thanking um, the National Network of Sector Partners and the strategic, uh, the strategic Venture Fund, as well as the City of Seattle, for their support in this effort. Um, we really hope that both this report and the webinar can serve as useful tools for others as they examine the growing green economy and sectoral strategies as opportunities of tomorrow in the growing green economy. Um, the aim of this project has been to provide a foundation of information on the key aspects related to the greening of our economy, using local experience to guide potential recommendations for similar sectoral strategies. So next slide, please. Um, just a brief overview of, oops. Went twice. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. Um, so just a brief overview of the work, both part of the report and this presentation. Um, we will highlight some significant policy and legislation, um, including impacts of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act on funding for green job training and green job creation potential. Um, we'll highlight some significant efforts to make sure that as the greening of America progresses, it includes measures that are good for the environment, good for the economy, and good for every American. We examine activity locally from both business and economic development stakeholders to move the Puget Sound region um, forward in the clean energy conversation. Um, we attempt to call from a variety of resources um, to identify eight specific industry sectors largely impacted by green economic development in the growing green economy and provide some examples of the jobs needed to support this growth. We consider some of the challenges to labor market supply in light of this growth and look at existing workforce preparation programs in the Puget Sound region as an example of training opportunities for the jobs that will be required. We um, use Puget Sound as an example for these sectoral strategies currently taking place, um, specifically in the area of energy efficiency, and close by providing some recommendations for research um, researching green sectoral strategies as part of other workforce and economic development efforts. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, forward. So significant activity has taken place at federal, state, and local levels aimed at improving connections to the growing green economy with appropriate workforce and economic development measures. Um, at the federal level in 2007, the Green Jobs Act as part of the energy bill established worker training programs to help create a workforce capable of building more energy efficient buildings and infrastructure, directing $125 million to training 35,000 individuals nationally in the clean energy sector, with um, $25 million earmarked specifically for creating pathways out of poverty in the growing green economy. Um, most recently, as, uh, as part of the Serve America Act, the Clean Energy Corps Act um, was en enacted, providing training and skills in the clean energy sector for disadvantaged youth. For Washington State in 2008, um, first in the nation, clean action, uh, Climate Action and Green Jobs Bill was signed by Governor Gregoire, um, establishing a comprehensive green economy jobs growth initiative aimed at increasing the number of green jobs in Washington State to 25,000 by 2020. This bill included funding for labor market research to analyze potential growth in green sectors, as well as authorizing a green collar job training fund. More recently, as an extension of the 2008 bill, the Evergreen Jobs Act of 2009 um, focuses on specifics around job skills, training, and investment in workforce development for green jobs in the state of Washington. 
other activity at a, at a local level impacting Seattle and King County. Um, in 2008, the King County Council passed a motion encouraging the formation of training for and investment in green collar jobs, dedication of dedicating a portion of that funding to train specifically low-income individuals for entry-level green collar jobs, as well as working with industry stakeholders to identify skill requirements. And um, as of last week, as part of um, Seattle Mayor Nichols' pledge to reduce Seattle's emissions by 20 percent um, by 2020, um, we recently announced the Green Building Capital Initiative, which includes providing low-cost energy audits to Seattle residents. The initiative aims to perform 5,000 of these audits over the next couple of years and expect to produce at least 200 jobs in the energy efficiency field in the city of Seattle. Next slide, please. So the American Re Recovery and Reinvestment Act includes um, many provisions which, ha which have the potential to significantly impact the job creation for this growing green economy. Um, the, of note, and I won't go into significant detail here, but um, the Workforce Investment Act um, dollars have been doubled with an additional in infusion of $3.6 billion. Um, the high-growth uh, high and emerging industry sector grants have inclu include $500 million directly for the funding the Green Jobs Act of 2007, and other um, Energy efficiency legislation includes the Energy Efficiency Conservation Block Grants, which are competitive grants to cities, have um, seen an influx of $3.2 billion. Weatherization assistance programs have, have seen an influx of $5 billion, and state energy programs have, will see an influx of $3.1 billion. So directly or indirectly, this infusion of dollars and job creation potential will require a significant upswing in job training to make sure that there is a workforce properly trained for the green work of tomorrow. In the next slide. The report takes a moment to highlight those national campaigns that are actively connecting conversations about energy independence with populations most impacted by job loss and job shortages, encouraging the creation of quality family wage jobs in the growing green economy as pathways out of poverty. These organizations are significant resources for information for this report as, and others, as well as influential players in these discussions around green jobs. Um, all of these organizations listed here promote policies and initiatives to speed investment in clean energy technology and energy efficiency, as well as commitment to job training and job creation for all. Next slide. While the recession may have slowed some of the growth spurt, um, particularly around financing, financing for projects, business is still moving. Many ARRA investments um, in clean technology and energy efficiency are aimed at growing jobs and growing businesses in the new green economy. Specific, specifically, um, there's $33 billion is devoted to clean energy initiatives and $27 billion in energy efficiency initiatives. In Washington State, activity continues to move on making the state a center for new green technologies. The Washington Clean Technology Alliance was formed in 2007 as a business alliance for clean tech sectors. Uh, aimed at securing the state's position as a leader in clean technologies. Um, other incentives, rebates, grant programs encourage business to adopt sustainability and efficiency standards while encouraging growth in this green economy. For the Puget Sound region, significant players in economic development include the Puget Sound Regional Council's Prosperity Partnership, which has identified the clean technology cluster for analysis and strategic development. In addition, Enterprise Seattle has created the Washington Energy Jobs Initiative with the goal of positioning Puget Sound and Washington State as a global center for emerging alternative energy and energy efficiency industry cluster. Next slide. So to understand the job creation potential of the growing green economy, we aim at it to identify eight potential industry sectors that were, which will see this growth. Um, Green building is the practice of increasing the efficiency which, with which buildings specifically use resources such as energy, water, and materials, while reducing building impacts on human health and the environment through better siting, design, construction, and removal. Energy efficiency is the use of technology as well as operation and maintenance that requires less energy to perform the same function, so getting more use out of the energy we already create. 
Um, renewable energy is produced through resources such as sunlight, wind, rain, tides, and geothermal heat, which may be naturally replenished. Recycling and waste management is the collection, transport, processing, recycling, or disposal of waste materials to reduce their effect on human health and the environment and or to recover resources from them. Um, smart grid and smart energy can be defined as the improvement of power delivery systems to be more efficient, reliable, and safe. Biofuels and biomass refers to the creation and use of fuel sources from chemical or biological materials other than fossil fuels for the generation of power. Alternative transportation encourages the creation of modes of transportation such as electric cars, mass transit, bicycles that are powered by sources other than depleting fuel sources. And sustainable agriculture and horticulture encourages practices in plant and animal production that are efficient and sustainable. And these uh, eight sectors intersect um, with similar work at the state level done by the Washington State Employment Security Department as funded through our Climate Action and Green Jobs Act 2008. Um, showing that the, the, the intersection between these, these sectors really is, is apparent and um, it helps to have this framework when thinking about what kind of jobs are created. So uh, next slide, please. So the jobs created in the growing green economy can be defined in a variety of ways. Broadly, the green jobs are those that have a direct positive impact on the environment and promote environmental protect protection and or energy security. And this is as defined by, again, the Washington State um, study. Within that, uh, the larger green jobs category, there's an emphasis that's been placed on what we call green collar jobs. And these are traditionally those blue collar jobs that are getting a green lining. More importantly, these are the jobs um, that are local and cannot be outsourced and um, should be in healthy working environments and pay good family supporting wages as well as provide opportunities for skill and wage advancement. Many of these jobs in the growing green economy will be new jobs, but mostly the old jobs with new skills are the ones that will see big impacts. Um, a, a, sometimes an easier framework to think about this are, is around green work and not necessarily the actual jobs. Further, a lot of the jobs will be in existing sectors um, more indirectly connected, so the business positions to support the growth in these, in these industry sectors. So the next slide. Um, list just a few examples of green jobs within each of these industries. You can see that green building, a lot of um, there's an, some the same old positions like construction equipment operators, carpenters, and roofers. Um, within energy efficiency, we can expect electricians to be required, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning installers, energy auditors, and insulation workers. Renewable energy will have a need for iron and steel workers and sheet metal workers to help construct the solar panels and wind turbines. Uh, recycling and waste management, you can expect to see hazardous materials removal workers and waste treatment plant operators. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, as far as smart grid and smart energy, um, power engineers and computer technicians, building operators will all be required to make sure that these efforts are, are moving forward. Um, biofuels and biomass, you'll need um, individuals doing um, processing technician work, as well as industrial truck drivers. Alternative transportation will include anything from bike repairs to hybrid maintenance technicians to welders. And sustainable agriculture and horticulture may include anything from organic farm workers to green roof installers. So next slide, please. Analysis of growth projections for some of the known job categories as listed in the previous slide associated with green work reveals that over the long term, job opportunities will continue to grow. This table focuses specifically on some of the energy efficiency related occupations and are specific to Puget Sound, um, the Seattle King County region. Um, as an, 
what this shows is that over the long term, even with current economic um, conditions, we can expect that these are opportunities that are going to grow. Um, they'll put many people back to work, but also create new opportunities for those with the appropriate skills needed to do the work. More importantly, many of these occupations are middle skill jobs, which are those jobs that require more than a high school diploma, but not a four-year degree. And within that group, many of these are middle wage jobs, which actually are family sustaining wages for the Puget Sound region, paying $17 an hour plus benefit. Next slide, please. While demand is current and growing, the reality is that there's a short supply of a ready skilled workforce to do the work. Increasing retirements in the trades combined with low numbers of young people entering apprenticeships that feed trade projects are and will continue con to constrain the growth in the green economy. While short-term recession dynamics may stall retirement of some individuals, the long-term reality means that these individuals will be leaving the workforce without an adequately trained uh, um, body of individuals to replace them. Um, as the employers report and continue to do so that a lack of skills has the potential to stall the potential for advancement in many of the growing green industry sectors. So next slide, please. In order to meet the potential demand of the growing green economy in light of these labor market issues, the availability of a workforce that is trained for and ready to enter these good green opportunities is essential. Efforts are underway in the Puget Sound region to address the industry workforce needs through skill standards and curriculum development. The Northwest Energy Efficiency Task Force was formed to bring together a group of high-level leaders to focus and improve the efficiency and electricity use throughout the Pacific Northwest. As part of this effort, Centralia Community College um, Center of Excellence for Energy Technology is coordinating existing energy efficiency programs across the Pacific Northwest. Um, in addition, skills panels past and present, including the current Green Construction and Green Building Skills Panel um, formed in 2008 through the Climate Action and Green Jobs legislation, are engaging all levels of industry stakeholders, employers, educators, workforce development, labor, and local government to prepare the region for the work to be done and the skilled workforce to do it. Um, there are opportunities um, in place to connect youth to this growing green economy, including the Opportunity Greenway, which is King County Youth Learning, a King County um, initiative connecting youth to learn about the skills required and jobs created for green through classroom and on-the-job training in various green fields, such as carpentry, weatherization, energy auditing, power utility work, um, cement mason work, heating and cooling installation, and energy efficiency window glazers. There is also the SWITCH project within, in Seattle, which is an innovative community-based energy conservation partnership connecting economically disadvantaged and socially disconnected young adults to the new green economy through basic home weatherization and energy efficiency training. In addition, there are a host of different types of pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship opportunities, pre-apprenticeships in construction, including SEI's pre-apprenticeship um, construction training. Um, there is a, a line worker pre-apprenticeship uh, at Seattle City Light, and there is work on the ground at local community colleges to create opportunities in pre-apprenticeship into um, the apprenticeships and the trades. Um, and finally, there are a variety of programs at community colleges um, providing short-term, one-year certificates and two-year degrees in a, a host of different areas around green. Um, and here's just a short list, including others in various stages of development. Next slide. So uh, as part of the paper, we choose to um, take a, a closer look at Puget Sound in, and our focus on energy efficiency um, as an industry sector for potential, potential growth. Um, the energy efficiency sector is relative, relatively low cost in terms of implementation. Um, the industry within the region is large, well-established, and growing. Um, the recent Washington State green economy research points to 69% of all green jobs currently in Seattle King County are in energy efficiency. And the majority of this work, roughly 70%, requires construction, manufacturing, and utility industry skills. So as an example to address this growth, um, the Northwest Energy Efficiency Workforce Opportunities Project, or NUOP, 
is funded through a recent Living Cities grant to the Seattle King County Workforce Education Collaborative um, in partnership with key stakeholders representing education, workforce development, economic development, labor, industry, and local government. This project will inventory current energy efficiency training curriculum, capacity, entry points, and competencies create an intermediary to fill the gaps needed to grow the appropriately skilled workforce and identify linka linkages to commercial energy efficiency career pathways. It will also pilot a cohort-based training program into residential energy efficiency occupations. And last slide, please. So we closed with some recommendations on how to do similar work for other um, areas. Um, with some four key categories. In terms of policy, it is, um, it's good to know policy, especially dollars, um, both into training and into larger green initiatives that will impact job growth, um, and identify how new policies potentially align with current strategies in your local areas. In terms of economic development, um, it's essential to have this conversation be included. Um, understanding the workforce needs of employers as they grow their green opportunities, uh, opportunities is essential. Um, labor market, it's important to understand the broader labor market issues, both in light of the current economic situation and longer term job shortage issues. Many states and locales have or are currently conducting labor market studies to identify growth potential for various industry sectors going green. And this can be a great resource to understand the current and future um, green opportunities. And finally, understanding capacity of current workforce training and education systems is essential. Um, partnering with organizations currently providing training as well as industry stakeholders in need of a greening workforce to ensure successful strategies is essential. And with that, I will um, put up the last slide and thank Jim again for this opportunity and pass it off to you, Jim. Thank you, Juliet. That was great. Um, what we'll do now is we'll uh, go to some questions. I'd like to remind people about how to ask questions. Um, if you uh, raise your hand, there's a, a button uh, on the left of your control panel. If you click that, your hand will go up. And seeing your hand up will cue us to call on you and unmute you. Uh, you can also ask questions using the questions pane uh, of that control panel. And you just type your question in, uh, send it off, and we will uh, read it and also give you the chance to elaborate if, if you like. Um, so our first, uh, first person with a call was uh, Gordon, uh, with a question was Gordon Anderson. We'll, un we'll unmute you, Gordon. Your, pr your question was about pre-apprenticeship programs and wanting some more information, I think, from Juliet about uh, pre-apprenticeships. Um, so click on, the, click on the little green, click there. OK, we're having difficulty uh, unmuting you, Gordon. Why don't uh, uh, we give? you the chance, Juliet, to uh, maybe provide a little bit more information about the inclusion of green principles into the pre-apprenticeship programs that you looked at. Uh, well, in Seattle, we have a handful of pre-apprenticeship programs, that, um, including the Seattle Vocational Institute has a, a pre-apprenticeship in construction training. And they are including um, green skills training into their pre-apprenticeship work. So they are, they're, they're building in far, as um, introductions to uh, solar panel installation, um, bringing in new materials. A lot, again, a lot of the skills are some of the same construction skills that are required today, um, but there's a change in materials, and so they are they are actively um, building that in. There is other work is at, um, and I I don't want to call people out, but um, I think I saw Joe Houth on the phone. Um, at South Seattle Community College looking into creating opportunities, a broad-based green pre-apprenticeship training program that can, in, while teaching green trades, um, give individuals opportunities to enter into other apprenticeships located down at South. And so I don't know if 
and um, well, if we have problems unmuting people, we may have a hard time unmuting Joe. But oh well, yeah, um, I think I'm unmuted. Oh, he's unmuted. There you go. Yeah, this is Gordon Anderson. Uh, my, oh. my question was more fundamental, <laughs> and, and I'm trying to differentiate the different uh, differentiate between pre-apprenticeship and apprenticeship programs. Who who are pre-apprenticeship programs directed to, and what do they do? Um, I have pre-apprenticeship programs really are geared to those individuals who um, are interested in going into the apprenticeship trade but are, don't have some of the basic skills that are required. Some, so for instance, some of the basic, basic math skills um, are specific to our Seattle City Light line worker pre-apprenticeship program. Some of that's around physical capabilities, understanding some of the basic electrical work. So really providing people with that, the, the baseline skills that are required to get them into the door for apprenticeship. Okay, thank you. Um, we uh, uh, we can't reach uh, Joe at the moment, but okay. uh, we do have another question. This question is from uh, Lindsay Woolsey of Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, and Lindsay will uh, attempt to unmute you now. Um, but your, uh, Lindsay's question was, Juliet, what are the top top occupations for entry level workers being made available with short term uh, recovery act funds? And are there examples emerging yet for clear pathway connections to longer-term careers? So responding, uh, you know, how can the Recovery Act funds be plugged in immediately and then uh, build long-term occupation uh, opportunities for people? Um, some, I, I will try to answer that question specifically around the, uh, the recovery dollars. So a lot of that money, as, a, as an example, is going into funding additional home weatherization. So there, is, there are efforts to really making sure that there are entry-level opportunities for, say, installers. Um, but we, as part of that new opportunity, the new op project, we are trying to make sure that there's a clear, um, what we call residential energy efficiency training pathway. So individuals don't get stuck at the, at the installer level, but they're provided opportunities to move up to crew chief level and then re connecting them to education around residential energy auditing and giving them an opportunity to move into that. And then um, with an eye towards the fact that in two years that, that money will be spent um, appropriately and we need to make sure that these individual, individuals have a place to go, the new op project is looking at how we can connect these residential energy jobs into commercial energy efficiency work, such as you know, all the commercial buildings that are ultimately going to need to be retrofitted. Uh, Lindsay, did you have a follow-up to that question or uh, any other um, aspects of it that we ought to consider? No, that was, a, that was a great response. I mean, overall, I think what I'm looking for are, are sort of these concrete examples, because what I'm seeing across states and local areas is that um, you know, we're all under pressure to spend this recovery package uh, quickly, and so I'm worried that we will, um, in that need to spend it quickly, we will lose the opportunities to take the time to create the real connections and real pathways that we need to um, to build build the foundation forward. Um, you know, for the green, the longer term green economy. So I, the new op program is a wonderful concrete example, and I appreciate that. And I think that what makes New Op um, a great opportunity um, is that it really is, it, it's making sure that there are opportunities now for individuals to get job training um, and, and entry into these jobs, but providing them with a foundation so that in the long run they're still um, being included in, in this growth. You know, just to follow up on, on this uh, question, um, you know, in listening to the different funding streams available, it made me wonder which of those funding stri uh, streams include funding specifically for job training and, and which have to have some funding essentially carved out. Uh, it may not be a given that job training is included in them. Do you have a sense of, of how that's shaking out, which, which areas uh, are, uh, you know, really including job, uh, job training and which are uh, you know, may include job training if there's um, advocacy to support that? Uh, I think that there's, um, in, in some of those cases, there, there's kind of um, room for opportunities. So for the energy efficiency block grant work, that's, that is given to 
cities to move conservation efforts forward, and I don't know how specific it requires that they're, if it allows for using those dollars for training specifically. Um, the weatherization dollars, I believe, do not include specifics around job training dollars. They have some, but. Um, and the state energy programs, those don't have specific job training dollars attached to them, but again, those are, they're, they're going to require a lot of people to do the work. So that is, that is a conundrum. Well, uh, Gordon Anderson, I, I see that you have your uh, hand up. Um, and yes, am I on the speaker? Yes, you're, you're live. Um, I, I have a question that has to do with the labor market demand and the issue of, uh, of jobs in middle skill, middle wage ranges, particularly as they relate to the the, uh, the jobs of carpenters, electricians, plumbers, HVAC, and so forth. You know, these are jobs that are used in two building areas. One is a commercial building area, and the second is a residential building area. And with what's happened in the housing market, there have come a whole lot of people in those trade skills and residential looking for jobs, whereas commercial, as I understand it, at least in our labor market area, uh, those jobs are staying pretty well alive. Would it be fair to say that your uh, strategy in Seattle is, if you have the same thing happening, is to try and tweak those jobs towards green-related uh, applications so that when uh, residential comes back, you'll you'll have people who who are appropriately skilled for putting green into residential as well as commercial. I'm a little concerned because I'm I'm thinking I, I'm being told by people in the building trades industry that we've got more we we don't need to train any more people. We've got all we need. And and my question is, should we be training the people who are perhaps unemployed for these green skills be in, in the hopes that they'll be able to be used in the future? Um, I think that uh, part of the goal around the new op project specifically, but I think broadly, is that we are we're providing a foundation of kind of systems thinking. So understanding that these these if we if we distill the skills and competencies that are required for these jobs and understand and figure out a way that you know, training in residential can also marry up with training in commercial or vice versa. I think that um, that's, that's where the opportunity lies currently. As far as, um, I mean, the, the research shows that even if we have enough individuals to do the construction work that's available currently, we have enough appropriately trained people. There, there's, you can't deny the fact that there's going to be a huge retirement issue coming up within the next five to ten years. So having people ready within five years to take the place of those individuals who are currently available to do the work. I think that's required. Thank you. Okay, I see that uh, Joe House has uh, raised his hand. Um, and uh, Joe, I'm unmuting you. Uh, do you have a question or do you want to uh, uh, contribute to the conversation? Sure, I had a question. Um, I just wanted to ask, one of the things that we're looking at, and we have an energy auditing program for residential energy auditing, and it's really growing in, in demand. We and, have, and Joe, can you, just, can you just say where, you're, where you are? I'm from South Seattle Community College Thank you. in Seattle, Washington, and we're currently offering a residential energy auditing course uh, that leads to BPI certification, and looking at expanding that out to commercial and multifamily. So we were very happy to see the mayor's initiative to uh, subsidize energy audits 5,000 with through Seattle City Light. And so we're seeing that market demand, but we're kind of playing an interesting chicken and egg dance around labor market demand. So we have very strong student demand, but our concern is that they have jobs when they get out. And so I was wondering if, Juliet, if you know if anyone is kind of tracking what utility initiatives are doing to incentivize the demand for energy auditing, either commercial or residential, and and who's keeping track of that? Because we're we're trying to get our pulse on what the labor market is going to look like as we're graduating these trained energy auditors out. Um, I haven't uh, specifically looked into kind of the broad-based utility incentives that are, that are going to impact this, but um, I am sure. 
I can find a resource for you. Um, the Cows um, Center on um, Wisconsin Strategy Work. Um, I just remember them as cows. Uh, cows has done a lot of work around commercial um, co commercial building and construction demand, specifically around uh, the utilities. And so they may have some national-based research that can help you understand the labor market issues around that. And I guess the other question too is if other cities across the country are pursuing what Seattle is doing right now to incentivize low-cost energy auditing. So I don't know if anyone has an answer on that. So I'll just say that, uh, that if you do have something to weigh in on this, you, you can either uh, raise your hand or send me uh, something in the questions box and we'll try to give you a chance to contribute what, what you know of. Um, I have a question from uh, Mara Boyce, um, whom I'm unmuting. Um, Mara, can we hear you? Hi, yeah, we're, we're in D.C. and we're a local um, advocacy organization advocating around green jobs. And there's a kind of um, variety of capacity with our local training organizations for greening their existing job training programs, particularly in the green building trades. And we were wondering if some of the um, competitive funds being provided under the Green Jobs Act can be used to help organizations build their green jobs training capacity um, and be used towards curriculum development, or if those dollars have to just be used um, directly towards training. And I, I know the guidance might not be out on that money yet, but uh, that was our uh, there, uh, I can point you to one resource which has been really helpful in figuring out how these dollars are being spent, which is there's a document by Green for All and Policy Link called Bringing the Green Recovery Home. Uh, okay. And that uh, document outlines specifics around um, how dollars can be spent. Um, I, if I see some of the dollars um, can now be used towards cohort training at community college, but I don't know if it's, it's available to be used to build existing capacity for programs that aren't previously connected. So, But I was, I I was just going to Green for All, and um, they have a lot of great resources. I will, I will say, and I know that the Recovery Act allows for uh, the provision of uh, training through the community colleges and contracting directly in a way that hadn't been done, but that's the, the core uh, recovery uh, WIA dollars, and I, I don't think that the guidance is yet out for um, use of the Green Jobs Act um, funds. Um, but anyway, I, I was going to follow up on your suggestion of the resource, uh, Juliet, by asking, are there other resources that you found in the process of, of developing your study to be particularly useful or that you're aware of that, uh, that people might uh, look at? Well, I think that, I mean, our eye was towards Washington State, so we relied heavily on work done by um, the Washington State Department of Community Trained and Economic Development, which was um, was funded through that the Climate Action and Green Jobs Bill. Um, a lot of their labor market research, um, a lot of the work being done by the skills panel, and just, uh, just kind of tapping into the local resources that we had. Um, and then from the, at the national level, sources like those advocacy groups that I listed, as well as organizations like the Workforce Alliance. A lot of the, the, the heavy hitters that I'm sure a lot of people on the call are, are familiar with were, were a great resource for this work. And if I remember correctly, you, you have a, a kind of list of some of those resources in the report itself? I do. The, it ends with a, a list of, of reports and, and um, contacts. Um, again, some of it is specific to energy efficiency, and some of it is specific to the Puget Sound region, but I think that um, there are probably parallel resources for other states and locales. So I'll just mention that as uh, within the invitation to this webinar, everyone should have received an image of the report, which actually has a link to the report itself. It's also posted on the NNSP website. So if you're interested in, in uh, going into greater depth uh, in, into uh, Juliet's work, um, that's a good place to start. Um, I have a follow-up question from uh, Lindsay Woolsey, and it's a, it's a simple question that just is, uh, what's uh, 
Seattle's Jobs Initiative's role within the new op project? Uh, well, so we have, um, we are part of the, the pilot-based cohort training um, portion. So there's a nine-month uh, planning stage followed by a six-month implementation piece. And we are um, planning to wrap around individuals who go through that training program. Um, we are also going to work closely with the Seattle King County Workforce Development Council, who is heading up the work around um, the, kind of the research and development uh, phase around commercial and residential energy efficiency, helping to pull together um, existing curriculum and, and uh, doing jobs analysis and uh, basic skill competencies. Great. I see that Joe House hand is raised. Joe, is that a uh, holdover from before, or do you, do you have something new you'd like to, to say? You're, you are unmuted. Oh, thanks. Uh, you can take me off. That's fine. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. Thank you. Okay. Um, I realize I had a, another poll that uh, uh, was going to ask people to weigh in on. This has to do with the context of the industry context within, your most, within which you're most interested in green jobs. Um, we uh, uh, clearly see that this uh, spans or cuts across industries, although, uh, Juliet, I think your framework is really helpful for thinking about, you know, which subsectors of industries might be of interest. I'm just going to ask you to take a second and, and let, let everyone know what your uh, industry interest is within uh, the green jobs issue. We'll just take a few seconds to let people There is a lot of cross-sector interest. Just a few more seconds. Um, so uh, interestingly, uh, most folks are interested not within the context of a specific industry, but across industry sectors. Um, which I'll, I'll have to admit surprises me uh, somewhat, uh, because I know that there are lots of folks working in particular sectors, like manufacturing and construction particularly, but of course energy as well. Um, so uh, that's, I think, just in the context of an interesting finding. Let me see if there are any other questions. Now is your last chance if you do have a question to uh, to submit it. Oh, okay. So um, we have a question from oh, from, from uh, Janet Laranaccio. and the question I'm unmuting you, Janet, but I think your question is a simple one: if you'll have access to this presentation. Right. Uh, that's it. Oh, that's, I, I believe it will be both on the Seattle Jobs Initiative website and the NNSU website, correct? Yeah, so in addition to the, the recording, we'll, we'll post the uh, uh, PowerPoints uh, so that you can look at it, and uh, the report itself will be up there. So you should have a, a wealth of, uh, of information about this webinar. Um, and thanks for asking that question, because I wanted to make sure people knew that. Okay. So I think what we'll do now is uh, uh, close our questions. Um, I want to thank uh, Juliet for, for presenting and for fielding these excellent questions. Um, I want to say a few uh, last words. Uh, there will be an evaluation that will follow the, this webinar. When you close your window, um, your webinar window, a uh, brief evaluation will pop up. We would really appreciate your candid feedback, as it will help us uh, improve how we do these in the future. It also includes a uh, suggestion for additional uh, subjects that you'd like to see covered in future webinars. Um, you can also, if you prefer, just email me. My email address is showing on the screen. Um, there are some dates I'd like to encourage you to save. Uh, one is uh, three weeks from yesterday, Wednesday, May 20th, when we'll have 
uh, a webinar focused specifically on the energy efficiency sector and uh, uh, address uh, you know an investigation of the employer needs and the occupations some key occupations within energy efficiency so uh, as I mentioned you'll receive invitations uh, because you registered for this but we'll look forward to jo your joining us then and then again I, I would encourage you to consider attending our national conference. Uh, Green is going to be a, a big part of that. And um, in addition, we expect to have uh, policy-related activities, um, uh, communities of, of practice by industry, and of course, our, uh, a panoply of, of workshops and site visits. So um, uh, if it's of interest, save the date, and you can find more information on our website. Let me ask uh, uh, Juliet, is there anything else that you would like to uh, add before we close? Uh, no, I think that we're all set. I appreciate the opportunity to present. Well, I want to thank you, and I want to thank our, our guests. I, th I want to thank you for joining us. Um, we will close the webinar and look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks a lot. <laughs>